Anton Ishte, Leo Varadkar, bienvenus de nuevo. Welcome back to Colombia. You were here in 2017 as part of the delegation with uh, President Higgins. Now, diplomatic relations have obviously improved substantially since 2017. We have the embassy uh, here, which you officially opened on Monday. We're recording this on St. Patrick's Day, and Colombia has an embassy in Dublin. You are now Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Would it be fair to say, though, from a trade perspective, both Colombia and Ireland would view each other as small fry. And what have you seen in these last few years and now during this, this visit since Monday that you've been here in terms of where maybe we can grow the opportunities for advancement? Muchas gracias y uh, feliz uh, día de San Patricio. Um, really pleased to be here in uh, Colombia and earlier in, in Chile representing Ireland for uh, the St. Patrick's Day uh, ministerial missions. As you said, was here first with President Higgins back in 2017. Um, and really in the past five years, there has been uh, a very um, strong deepening of relations between Colombia and Ireland. Um, they've opened their embassy in Dublin. We've opened our embassy uh, here in Colombia. Um, and uh, part of my part of what what I did when I was Taoiseach w was set out in Global Ireland 2025 that we would uh, double our influence and global footprint. And part of that was opening new embassies in Santiago, in Chile, and um, Bogota here in Colombia. So it's um, uh, a privilege and an honour to be be allowed to do those official openings. Um, and I am here, of course, astonished uh, as well as Minister for Enterprise, Trade, and Employment. So it's covering the full range of government interests, not just uh, trade issues. Um, trade between Ireland and Colombia, as you say, is small, um, but it's not negligible. Um, it's uh, about 120, 130 million in, in uh, goods and about 300 million in services. Um, and we do think there's a lot of scope for expansion. Uh, so just to give you an example of two companies that are Irish that are operating here, uh, Smurfit Kappa um, has, employs over 3,000 people here in packaging. Um, Declan Ryan's Viva Air is the main um, low-cost airline, if you like, here in Colombia, uh, mm -hmm. and Mainstream Power is very involved in uh, harnessing renewable resources here, um, and then a lot of companies uh, in fintech and health tech as well. So uh, definitely we're coming off a relatively low base, but uh, I think the potential is very large, um, not just in trade, but also in areas like education, for example. Yeah, education. You signed a memorandum of understanding, I believe, with the uh, Minister for, for Education here in Colombia. So, so what exactly is that about? We're going to see various kind of programs between universities here in Colombia and Ireland. Uh, what, what is the scope of that? Yeah, so there's a, a memorandum of understanding we now have uh, between the Ministries of Higher Education uh, in Ireland and Colombia, uh, and also uh, Universidad dos Andes um, has a Irish Studies programme, and I was delighted to meet the students participating in that programme today and speak to them. Uh, and they now have a partnership both with the University of Limerick and with Trinity College. So, you know, these things are starting to happen. What I'd love to see is um, more Colombian students coming to Ireland to study in our universities, um, to learn English, uh, to work if they want to. Um, we have a lot of uh, Brazilian students, for example, in Ireland, which people would know, um, maybe not so many from Colombia, even though it has a population of more than 50 million people, uh, and also would like to see more collaboration between Irish universities and some really high quality education institutions here uh, I I here in Colombia. So the MOU that we signed really is the framework that allows us to do that. Uh, I think one area that where we can do better in Ireland is, is on visas. Um, uh, Colombians need a visa to come to Ireland, have to pay for that visa. Uh, that's not the case from a lot of other countries in Latin America. So uh, that's something I, I'll try and uh, improve or change and have been in contact with Minister McEntee about that already. Well, I can tick that one off the list of questions that I was going to ask you because I have to say the Irish community, or it is one now, we were talking off air, uh, I'm single, but a lot of my friends who have Colombian partners or whatever are just friends, and I have a lot of friends who, who are interested in going to Ireland, and that is an issue. Of course, we are part of the EU. I have to say, like President Higgins said in 2017 that Ireland could be a bridge to Europe for Colombians, but the reality is it's kind of more of a barrier because we're not part of the Schengen. It, could we be part of the Schengen, or what's what's the deal there? Yeah, I, I would love Ireland to be part of the Schengen Agreement, um, but the reason why we're not is for a very good reason, and that's because the United Kingdom is not, uh, and we have a common travel area with the UK. Uh, so if we were to join the Schengen area, um, we would have passport checks between um, Britain and the United Kingdom, and while that might be okay at airports and ports where 
de facto those checks exist already, it would potentially mean checks on people travelling between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and that's not something we could ever countenance. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, we can't join Schengen. It's like a lot of things uh, that we would like to do when it comes to European integration. We have to bear in mind the fact that um, uh, our country is partitioned and uh, part of Ireland is still part of the United Kingdom, and we have to take that into account. Am I right in saying, though, your ancestral home in China, that if you have a visa for the UK and vice versa, Chinese and Indians can travel? So could there be something like that as well worked into it? Uh, well, the visa waiver scheme is al already in place. So if you're Colombian and you have a UK visa, if you go to the UK, you can then uh, come on to Ireland. Um, but it's still a barrier, uh, as you say. And um, things are a little bit better. Certainly the Colombian and Irish people I've met here have said to me it's much easier now there's an embassy in Bogota than when they had to send uh, passports to our embassy in Mexico City. Um, but what I'd, I'd like really is to get to the point where there's no charges, um, where a, a UK visa would work in Ireland and, and the UK, and we have a system for doing that. Um, but ideally get to the point that we have with... Um, uh, other countries in, in Latin America where uh, there's no visa required at all. If you're coming to the country for 90 days, you don't need a visa. Um, that has facilitated uh, you know, very close contacts between Argentina and Brazil and uh, Chile and uh, Mexico and Ireland. And uh, the fact we're, in fact, we have quite strict rules with respect to Colombia um, probably dates back to security issues of the past that aren't as significant now. But again, it's something I'll have to speak to um, the Department of Justice about and the Department of Foreign Affairs when I get home. Oh, well, OK, well, well, we'll keep you to your word on that one uh, there, Tarnish, because it is an important one for the Irish community. Um, speaking of the embassy here, if I'm not mistaken, there's a Garda, well, there is a Garda attaché here, but is that the first ever Garda attaché in any embassy? And... What are we to read into that it's here in Colombia? Obviously, we talked about trade relations, memorandum of understanding and education. But also, we, when we talk about Colombia, there is the drugs trade that we have to keep in mind. And I know you've been on the record coming out strong against the Kinahan cartel. With this Garda Tasha here, is this a sign that Ireland is upping the ante in terms of surveillance on these international cartels, uh, or is it just more coincidental? Um, well, it, it's not the case. It's the only, only place in the world that we have Garda Tasha. We have a, a number around the world. Um, okay. I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly where, but I, I know Paris, France is one of them, for example. First here in Latin America. Uh, the first, the first in Latin America, but you know, that I'm aware of, it may be the case that there are others. Um, but it's not, it's not a reflection on Colombia by any means that we have a guard attaché here. We have it in a number of countries, and it just allows for police cooperation. And uh, I signed uh, an MOU here in Colombia on behalf of uh, Commissioner Drew Harris uh, to facilitate further cooperation. Um, and you know, it is the case that uh, Colombia is a source of narcotics, and some come into Ireland and through Ireland, um, but it allows uh, our guardi to uh, work with the police here. But it also can work on a very practical level too, um, uh, all over the world. Um, uh, Irish citizens uh, sometimes uh, are victims of crime, and uh, having a guard of presence here can really help them if that happens, and vice versa. Okay. Uh, you met with President Duque yesterday, I believe. Was drugs an issue there? Because his predecessor, Juan Manuel Sant Santos, talked about uh, the need to, to change the course in the, in inverted commas, war on drugs. What are your, your thoughts on that? I think Duque would have a, a particularly different line from, from President uh, Santos. Do you think we'd need a different approach to the war on drugs? Um, well, to be honest, that, that wasn't uh, a very major topic of discussion. Um, we met for an hour, and it was great to have that level of access with um, President Duque. Um, and a number of ministers attended that breakfast too. Uh, we did talk about it in the context of the, the peace agreement, um, uh, but not in, in, any, um, uh, in any particular detail. And uh, I suppose it, it's not really my role here to tell the Colombian government what they should do in, in terms of their internal affairs, but did obviously want to talk about the full implementation of the peace agreement, um, the need to observe uh, things like human rights, for example, um, did express the concern that over 300 people uh, have been killed since the peace accords were signed, um, but renewed uh, Ireland's commitment to helping out in any way we can. And we do that in a number of ways. So one of the things I had the pleasure to visit, or the privilege to visit, was a demining project uh, near Cali, where the Irish government is helping to fund a demining project, which is allowing people to return to their lands. Okay. Just in general, though, and not specifically uh, in Colombia, but your thoughts on, on the war on drugs, though, because it, it is obviously a global issue. Uh, do you think it's the right approach? Or would you think legalisation in certain 
context might be a better approach? Um, uh, during the last government, we, we appointed a, a, a group to examine that uh, under um, Justice Gareth Sheehan, I think it was. Uh, and uh, his advice was that we not go down that route. Um, I know that uh, they have in Portugal. Um, and the Oireachtas Committee, Joint Oireachtas Committee, recommended that we should do that. The commission, uh, which was established in the last government, recommended that we not. And I know what the Taoiseach has now said is that we intend to do a citizens' assembly uh, on the issue of drugs and how best to uh, deal with it. And uh, we'd hope to do that during, well, we'd expect to certainly have that done during the course of this government, but uh, I don't really want to prejudice the outcome of that now. Okay. Just zooming out then from, from local affairs here, we'll say in Colombia and to the region in general, you, as you mentioned, you were in Chile, you were at the inauguration of the new president there, Gabriel Boric, uh, and I believe you met with other Latin American leaders, and one of the issues was uh, trying to persuade countries here to follow the EU's line on sanctions. How were you met when you, when you mentioned that to them? And I guess some people back home are wondering, well, why has Antonio decided to take this upon himself to encourage uh, Latin American countries to follow an EU line when we are neutral militarily anyway, uh, perhaps not politically? Well, I, I suppose I was very fortunate that the St. Patrick's Day visits coincided with the inauguration of the new president uh, in in Chile, and because I was the only, um, or, well, the King of Spain was there, but he's a monarch, obviously, and I, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a deputy prime minister, uh, so I was asked by by the European Union uh, to be the European Union's representative at the um, inauguration, um, which meant that I had an opportunity to meet with President Boric uh, formally, but also to meet with outgoing President Piñera and then the Vice President of Brazil and the Presidents of Ecuador and Uruguay and Peru as well. So it was a really good opportunity if you tried to organise those meetings. It might have taken weeks or months to organise. Uh, and it was an opportunity for me to uh, put across that, across that message from the European Union um, that we are asking the democratic world to stand together. Um, Latin American governments um, ranging from those on the right uh, in Colombia to those on the left in Chile have been very clear uh, that they're um, joining us in our opposition to uh, what Russia is trying to do in Ukraine. Um, their statements have been extremely clear and we really welcome that. Um, um, but we're asking them to back that up by joining uh, America, Europe and East, uh, the democracies of East Asia in imposing sanctions on Russia too. Uh, and that, w message was, that message was certainly heard um, and I, I certainly think that uh, here in Colombia, um, the president, President Duque, wants to do that, but we'll need congressional approval, and that's something that he'll have to obviously work on. Um, I suppose the exceptions in this region would be Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua, um, mm -hmm. but uh, no surprise, you know, that those countries um, are not really democracies, um, uh, oppress their own people, and um, like the Russians, recruit people in the West to say that ain't so. So it's not surprising they are supporting Russia, but um, they are the exceptions, I think, in Latin America. Yeah, you know, a couple of things there. Um, I do want to touch on Venezuela, but I might get to that in, in a second. It's just, uh, obviously, the last few years, now every generation, I think, thinks that, that their political leaders or how, how it's been run in democratic countries think that whatever their leaders are working against them, etc. But on the day that you landed in Colombia, we had 15,000 tons of Russian diesel landing in Dublin. So if we ask lower income, low income, middle income countries, uh, the developed world in inverted commas, to take on these sanctions, they perhaps will get a, a bloodier nose than the likes of Ireland uh, and high income nations in Europe. And then they will see, well, what kind of, okay, there are sanctions, obviously, and they're very strict sanctions, but to a point, we're still importing what we need from Russia. So people might think, well, it's do as I say, not as I do. Um, well, the sanctions that we've imposed on Russia are the strictest sanctions that um, have ever been imposed uh, in, in a very long time anyway, probably going back to South Africa and apartheid. That's the last time you would have had sanctions, economic and political, on this level in, in my, recognition, my, my recollection. And that will impact very heavily on a lot of European economies, uh, particularly those uh, near Russia, um, like Germany, for example, and the uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe that are very dependent um, on Russian gas and trade with Russia. So um, we'll be much more affected than the United States and Latin America will be 
um, but uh, we think it's necessary because uh, we have to say uh, that this is not the kind of thing that we can tolerate in the 21st century um, as an international community. Um, ironically, uh, now that we're no longer accepting Russian coal in, in money points to power our power station there, the coal is actually coming from Colombia. So ironically, that's an example of where um, Russian products may even be displaced by products from Latin America. Um, but there's no denying that the sanctions will have an impact on the countries that choose to impose them. Um, but we're doing it for the right reasons. We're doing it for humanitarian reasons. And we're doing it because uh, we have to say that uh, this can't happen in the 21st century. A couple of things again on that. Number one, you saw uh, rapprochement from the White House to Maduro and you mentioned Venezuela. Uh, again, not a, not a not a democratic country, and also Saudi Arabia, its record on human rights is shocking. Mm-hmm. So we kind of go well. We're imposing these sanctions. Obviously, Russia is in a war, a hot war. But these other countries that the West are causing up to now in an emergency don't exactly have a brilliant track record in terms of human rights. Uh, well, well, that's correct. Um, but I don't think we should. Um, uh, misunderstand the situation that's happening here. Um, What's happening in Russia uh, is a dictatorship is trying to uh, take over another country, uh, depose its democratically elected government, uh, impose a puppet government, uh, annex part of it, they already have annexed part of it, uh, and occupy more of it. Um, That is on a different level uh, to what we're seeing happening in Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. That doesn't justify what's happening there by any means. We need a return to democracy uh, in Venezuela. Uh, We need um, vast improvements on human rights in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, But I don't accept this view that because human rights uh, are violated in too many countries in the world, um, that uh, it's somehow uh, okay for us not to see that what's happening in Ukraine uh, is on a different level. This is not the kind of thing we've seen in Europe since the 1930s or 1940s. And we must say that this can't happen in the 21st century. Okay, I know we're against the clock, but just um, briefly, in the media, and we're seeing this in, in, I think, driven by a lot of the legacy media, to use that term, that kind of everything Russian now is evil. We've seen, I think, a University of Milan uh, banning Dostoevsky, Tchaikovsky uh, not being played in certain places. Like, there's, there is a danger, and as Irish people, I think we have to be aware of that, do you think, that, uh, okay, if you have a, uh, some criminal elements in your country, and in Russia's case, it is their leader, but not all Russians are evil. Uh, and, but that element seems to be coming, coming through in, in certain uh, reporting. Um, Well, I think we have to make the distinction between uh, President Putin and his government um, and the Russian people. Uh, And what I've seen uh, uh, is some extraordinary bravery by Russian people. You know, I saw the um, editor working in the TV station who protested uh, on television. Uh, We've seen people protest in St. Petersburg and Moscow against the war. Uh, These are extremely brave people. Uh, And I think it is important that we make a distinction between uh, Russians and the Russian people and what the Russian government is doing. Uh, But unfortunately, it's never going to be possible to impose sanctions um, uh, on a country um, that doesn't affect all of its people. So I think everyone would support the fact that uh, sanctions were imposed um, on South Africa uh, during apartheid, uh, even though that... um, uh, hurt um, black people and Indian people uh, economically as well, but these things are necessary. Okay. Just one, yeah, one final question. Um, I'm going to bring it back to Colombia. A presidential election coming up here in May, pretty crucial. Uh, if we're to believe the polls, and uh, I think neither of us are in a position that we believe polls anymore, and certainly not in this country as well, and uh, we know what they're like in Europe. But um, it looks like Colombia might head to, to have a leftist pres- president for the first time in its history. Uh, again, you mentioned Venezuela, so that might smooth relations with the Maduro regime or government, whatever you want to call it. But it wouldn't go down too well, I'm guessing, in Washington. Uh, you're from a party that's from, in an Irish context, centre, centre right. What would you think if Colombia does decide to go on a, a leftist route with a former uh, guerrilla as president, almost like, and I don't think you'd like this, Jerry Adams' as Taoiseach, it could be said. 
Uh, well, first, there's one thing I know about opinion polls um, is they don't predict the outcome of elections. So uh, we'll have to see what happens when the elections happen here. Um, but Colombia is a democracy. It's a matter for the people in this country to decide uh, who their president is. Uh, and whoever uh, the people of Colombia decide to elect uh, as their president, uh, we will try and, uh, and work with. And, you know, I've come from Chile where uh, a radical left president has been elected. Uh, president Boric was very pleased to be the first uh, EU leader, deputy prime minister, to meet with him uh, and to hear a bit, a bit from him about his plans. Um, and potentially he represents a, a new generation of left-wing leaders in uh, South America, uh, even though he comes from the student protests from the radical left. Uh, he has uh, been very clear on Venezuela and Nicaragua. And to a certain extent, that gives me some encouragement uh, that just because uh, a country elects a radical left leader doesn't mean they have to go down um, the route of Venezuela and Cuba. Uh, in fact, uh, he's been very, very critical of what's happened there and doesn't want to bring his country in that direction. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see. But ultimately, democracy means accepting the result. Uh, and it's uh, not our business to tell Colombians uh, who they should elect. Uh, and we'll work with any democratically elected government that we can. Antonio Stelio of Radker, thank you very much for your time. We'll go and enjoy the St. Patrick's festivities.